All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So today we're doing John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. Um, but before I start, uh, what did I leave out from last week? I have a, a, a fun little tidbit uh, anecdote from uh, James Monroe's administration. Um, James Monroe, uh, a military man in his younger years, um, as president, still very vigorous and assertive. Uh, so one evening at a state dinner, you have the, uh, the diplomats from France and England getting at each other's nerves. Somebody insults somebody else, and uh, as gentlemen, uh, basically they say, let's take it into the other room. And this is back in the day when still uh, it was common for gentlemen of a certain status to carry their swords with them at state dinners. And so uh, these two gentlemen took it into another room and they were going to have a sword fight right there uh, until James Monroe with his sword came in and broke it up, said, you will not do this in my house and uh, kept the two from uh, killing each other. So, yeah, kind of wild times back in those days. Uh, gentlemen could do things for their honor that uh, kind of unimaginable today. So, starting with John Quincy Adams, kind of a tragic figure as president, uh, like his father, had all the similar talents uh, politically, uh, which means none at all. Uh, hard work, intelligence, integrity, honesty, all of those things in spades, but had uh, no talent politically, or very little, I should say. So, the bibliography, Robert V. Rimini, John Quincy Adams, nice short biography. Uh, Remini is recognized as one of the uh, uh, experts in the field of U.S. history at this time. Also, I have one of Andrew Jackson by Remini, uh, considered one of the uh, uh, great historians of that age. Um, Fred Kaplan, John Quincy Adams, American visionary. Uh, 652 pages, a little more ambitious if you want to get into this one. I like this one. It's, it was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, who'd have thought that John Quincy Adams would have a, a biography uh, that was a bestseller? But um, American Visionary is a good title uh, because uh, John Quincy Adams was uh, a, a visionary for America. He had lots of grand, wonderful plans uh, for this country, uh, none of which he ever enacted uh, because of his uh, political skills or lack thereof. Um, Phyllis Lee Levin, The Remarkable Education of John Quincy Adams. Another wonderful book, um, very personal. Uh, it, you get a real feel for uh, the personalities involved, John Quincy Adams and his famous parents uh, being raised uh, as a very highly intelligent, ambitious uh, young man uh, by very highly intelligent parents. Um, a great story, uh, like I said. Uh, unfortunately for uh, this particular lecture, uh, she doesn't really get into his presidency much. But uh, for the background, um, this is a, a wonderful biography. So, the early years, born July 11th, 1767 in Braintree. Um, as a young man, uh, tutored by his famous mother, Abigail. Um, Abigail was a taskmaster very intelligent woman, as I've said before, uh, and very hardworking, very dedicated, and um, in some ways, um, we might consider it abusive, verbally speaking, 
uh, raising kids back in those days, if you were a, uh, a Puritan or descendants of the Puritans inheriting that uh, discipline, uh, very often parents could be uh, what we would consider uh, very abusive. Stop being so lazy. You would succeed if you weren't so lazy and, uh, and get off your butt basically and, and get to work. Um, yeah, so anyway, but at a very young age, since he had uh, uh, John Adams as his father who traveled as a diplomat so often, uh, at age 11, he traveled with his father to Europe, um, traveling to France, to the Netherlands, and um, was seen as something of his, as, as a prodigy. Uh, everyone noted what a, a highly intelligent young man he was. So uh, at age 14, he became the secretary to our representative in Russia and uh, got to know lots of people in Russia uh, and uh, a very popular young man, as I said, a very engaging. Um, and so eventually returned, uh, went to Harvard and graduated second in his class. And don't think that his parents were disappoint weren't disappointed that he was not first. If you were not so lazy, you would have made it. Started his law practice in 1790. I'm not going to get into his love life much other than to say his first love um, fell madly in love with a young woman, uh, but he was not ready to be married according to his parents because he could not support her yet. He had not established himself at, in his law practice, and so his parents berated him. You should know better. You are not ready yet to have such an attachment. Break it off. And he eventually he did. And some biographers will tell you that this was the only really passionate affair that he ever had. The woman that he eventually married was a good woman, a good wife, um, but was not apparently as, as passionate a relationship as his first. So in his political career, he was appointed ambassador to the Netherlands, 1794, then Portugal, then Prussia, uh, elected to the Massachusetts Senate, 1802, the U.S. Senate, uh, 1803. He resigned in 1807 because of his differences with his party. He had been uh, a federalist, but he was a Federalist who was not doctrinaire, would not always toe the line with the rest of the party. And he was known as someone who could uh, vote against uh, the interests of the Federalists. And it finally came to a head uh, with the Embargo Act, which uh, he was in favor of. The Federalists were adamantly against it in Thomas Jefferson's administration. And uh, John Quincy Adams was against them. So uh, eventually the Federalists uh, disowned him and he resigned from the Senate. Um, and of course he switched from Federalist to Republican. And then he was appointed minister to Russia, uh, 1809, and helped negotiate the, the Treaty of Ghent, uh, ending the War of 1812. But this is where he really shined. Secretary of State, being such a well-traveled man, uh, when he became Secretary of State under James Monroe for all eight years, um, this is the highlight of his career. Uh, and how could it be otherwise? Uh, he knew everybody of importance uh, in Europe, essentially. Uh, he was uh, extremely intelligent, knew how to work this system. And I said before, um, you know, he had no political skills. Uh, and that was in the United States when it came to campaigning and that sort of thing. But when it came to diplomatic skills, uh, he excelled. So uh, as Secretary of State, oddly enough, 
Um, since there were very few secretaries uh, under the president, uh, each secretary did jobs that we would think uh, wouldn't really uh, be a part of that office or part of that department. So uh, he, he did things like oversee the, the 1820 census. Um, he wrote a remarkable uh, report on weights and measures. He was asked by Congress to uh, report on uh, standardizing weights and measures. If you know anything about our system, uh, back in those days, it was a, a horrible mess. Each uh, region in the United States could have a completely different uh, standards for what a pound was, uh, what distances were. Um, they could vary uh, tremendously from state to state. And so uh, the Congress asked John Quincy Adams to put this report together. And he did a marvelous job, spent years uh, studying and writing out this report. And for the uh, historical geeks who would study such a thing today, they will tell you that this was a landmark and, and an incredible uh, report that he finally came up with and delivered to the Congress. Congress took one look at it and said, nice job, we'll shelve it now. <laughs> they did nothing about it. It was most likely uh, far uh, uh, over the heads of the vast majority of them and um, just uh, didn't really take the time to read it. Um, so also, he negotiated the acquisition of Florida after Andrew Jackson invaded and, um, and did his thing. Uh, Florida, the S Spain realized that uh, they needed to uh, pass Florida on to us uh, one way or another. And so it was Adams who negotiated that. Um, he, in his negotiations, set the boundary for the Louisiana Territory and, um, and was instrumental in working with James Monroe on the Monroe Doctrine. Um, Monroe gets the credit for that, as he should, because he was president. And, um, but it was John Quincy Adams who was instrumental in helping shape that doctrine. And then we get to the tragic side of uh, John Quincy Adams. Presidential election of 1824. Um, rather bizarre election. Uh, you have four, all essentially from the same party, because there's no other party. The, the Federalist Party has died. Um, the, the election of 1820, um, you have James Monroe. He was the only one to vote for. Uh, now, in 1824, as was inevitable, when you have a one-party system, it's going to break up. And so this is the process. You have four men from the same party, each wanting to be president. And so Henry Clay, William Crawford, John Quincy Adams, and Andrew Jackson. Henry Clay, what a character. He's, he's a guy I got to do someday. But um, uh, Henry Clay was almost certain that he was going to win. He had it in the bag. He controlled the vote in the House of Representatives. He was the man. He could sway the votes as he liked. In the United States Constitution, if you do not have a clear majority, this is what happens. So nobody had the sufficient number of electoral votes. So in the Constitution, it goes to the House of Representatives. And the top three are one from the top three is chosen as president. Henry Clay was sure that he would be among the top three. And at that point, he could sway the, the House to elect him president. Well, he was number four. 
he didn't quite make it. And uh, quite by accident, uh, a couple of the electors from Louisiana uh, couldn't get in their votes in time. And so he, uh, he missed out, very bitter about that because he wanted so badly to be president. So anyway, uh, but he was the man now who could sway the House uh, to who would be president. And um, tragically, he, uh, he had talks. He wanted to uh, find out who he should sway his votes for. He knew it had to be John Quincy Adams or Andrew Jackson. He didn't like either one of them. But uh, he wanted to be Secretary of State. The reason he wanted to be Secretary of State was because the last uh, several presidents, going back to uh, Thomas Jefferson, every president had been Secretary of State. So now it is um, the thing that everybody looks to. Who's Secretary of State? They very well could be the next president. And so he talked with John Quincy Adams, sort of secretive. Nobody knows exactly what was said, but we know that after those talks, uh, he swayed the vote to John Quincy Adams and John Quincy Adams made him Secretary of State. So it was, it was clear to their opponents, to Andrew Jackson's side, that this was a corrupt bargain. And for the next four years, that was the, uh, the theme, that uh, John Quincy Adams is corrupt, Henry Clay is corrupt, their whole administration is corrupt. And uh, people bought it. And so that is one of the main reasons uh, John Quincy Adams' administration uh, was pretty much a failure. <coughs> So anyway, here's the routine that John Quincy Adams had. Uh, he would rise at five or six o'clock in the morning, uh, walk four miles, maybe go for a swim in the Potomac. Um, he would read the Bible with commentaries, uh, read the newspapers and public documents, uh, have breakfast at nine, uh, meet with his cabinet at 10, uh, work on public business, meet with congressmen and other visitors until five, eat dinner, play billiards, and write letters and his voluminous diary until 11. Both uh, John Adams and John Quincy Adams were marvelous uh, as far as writing in their diaries. Uh, great historical documents uh, at this point. Uh, historians just love them. They're not the most entertaining to read, but they are informative and, and extensive. And uh, we owe a great debt of gratitude for both of them because there's so much information, uh, just in, both politically speaking, historic significance uh, speaking, and just in their uh, common, ordinary, day-to-day -day business. And he had great plans for the nation. He was a visionary, as this biography uh, mentions. Public works, roads, bridges, canals. This was a very controversial subject back in those days. Uh, should the federal government be involved in public works? And the nation was very divided on that question. Uh, it's, some would say it's not constitutional. The Constitution doesn't mention things like that, building roads and bridges and canals. So uh, that's something that the federal government should not do. Individual states may do that, and that's their business, but not the federal government. John Quincy Adams and a growing number of others uh, talked about, uh, we need a national plan. We need national vision for roads that go across uh, state lines, for canals, for bridges, for things that, is, that are in the national interest these are things we need to work on. Uh, he proposed a Department of the Interior. How about that? Well ahead of his time. Uh, it was, like the others, uh, pretty much shot down. Wanted to send emissaries 
to a conference of South American nations. As we know, South America uh, had the, the independence movement just like the United States, and a numbers of Americans uh, felt very sympathetic toward them. And so John Quincy Adams wants to send uh, emissaries who were invited to a conference in South America for the South American countries. On the other hand, you have his opponents who say, look, George Washington didn't want all these entangling alliances. Thomas Jefferson didn't want entangling alliances. We should not be involved in South American politics. And so uh, it, was, it was a battle in Congress to appoint uh, these ambassadors to go down to the, uh, this conference. Now, they were voted in. They had the votes. And so the opposition did all that they could to delay the funding of this trip and, uh, and succeeded. The trip was eventually uh, paid for uh, right after the conference had been settled. And so, yeah, you guys can go, but uh, the conference is over now. Uh, he wanted a national university and uh, uniform standards of weights and measures. Uh, when, and here's another tragic thing about the whole weights and measures thing. Um, eventually, we got that straightened out with as far as our uh, weights and measures goes. Um, but we had an opportunity when he first looked into this, and actually Thomas Jefferson looked into this uh, way back in the 1790s and proposed uh, the French system, which we all know as the metric system. And just think, if we could have changed back in those days to the metric system, how much easier uh, poor elementary school kids in measuring inches, feet, miles, pounds, ounces, all of that stuff. I remember going crazy as an elementary school kid trying to add, subtract all of those different really awkward measurements. And even today, uh, how many of you even know how many feet are in a mile, right? Okay, uh, how many, but yeah, I mean, we get the point, right? <laughs> the metric system is so much easier to deal with, and, and we could have had that, but uh, no, uh, it was not in the cards. So anyway, that's, this was something when, when uh, John Quincy Adams um, was pushing for standard weights and measures at, at this time, uh, he, he said himself in his report, um, it would be best to have the, uh, the metric system, but I know that the Americans are not going to change over from what we have, so I'm just wanting to get our system in place so that uh, we have something that makes sense in our own system, the standards of weights and measures at least we should be able to get it standardized across our states. So we have now a new Democratic Party. So Crawford, Calhoun, Jackson, and their supporters, um, they decide we need a new party to break away from the Republican Party. And they formed what is now the Democratic Party. And guess what? They're, uh, their principles, limited government, strict economy, um, keeping the debt, paying off the debt is another big goal. And um, yeah, it's kind of funny. It, who believes that anymore? Uh, neither party, really. Uh, but um, yeah, that was the founding principles on uh, Jefferson's philosophy of limited government uh, and uh, strict economy keeping, and, and another one, let's keep the military down, okay? We, we need to slash the, the military budget. We don't like standing armies because 
Uh, they promote tyranny. They're useful for kings in promoting wars and keeping their own population in check. Uh, so yeah, we want to keep the military small and we want to balance the budget and pay off the debt. That's the Democratic Party. Um, and they became a powerhouse and they became very well organized and uh, basically what they did was oppose everything that uh, John Quincy Adams uh, was in favor of. And so they were looking for the election of 1828. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm moving ahead here quickly. Um, so John Quincy Adams obviously lost big time in 1828 and moved on with his life to become a congressman, served in the House of Representatives after his tenure as president and uh, loved it. Um, he, he once said that uh, as when winning that election to the House of Representatives was uh, far more uh, satisfying to him than uh, win winning the presidency and served until 1848 and uh, fought very well against some very uh, evil things that were going on. The gag rule, you're not supposed to talk about slavery in the House of Representatives, and he fought that tooth and nail. Um, worked out a compromise for the Tariff of Abominations, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And um, as an attorney, how many of you have seen that movie, Amistad? Great movie. The, uh, a slave ship, a Spanish slave ship had been uh, taken over by the slaves, and uh, landed in the United States and uh, initially we are going to send them back as slaves but um, several people anti-slavery uh, people uh, put this up for trial that we are going to free these slaves that this was this whole thing was illegal and it was John Quincy Adams who was the attorney to help uh, the, the slaves aboard the Amistad Good movie if you've never seen that. So now we come to the age of photography. This is the first president who was ever photographed. Now, he was not president at the time of the photograph. We still don't have a, a, yet a president who as president was photographed. But this is the earliest president that we do have a photograph of. You think if he smiled, his face would crack. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's the grim visage of uh, John Quincy Adams. And some statues. Rapid City, South Dakota. They have lots of statues out there. And here's in Quincy. And one in Moscow. Who'd have thought that he was such a, a hero in Russia that uh, they wanted a statue of John Quincy Adams. But yeah, he was, he was uh, quite a popular figure there. Any questions on John Quincy Adams? You gotta move on to Andrew Jackson now. 